Hello world, it's Siraj. And if you don't know, I love to learn. But the way I learn is by no means traditional. My favorite physicist, Richard Feynman, encapsulated my mentality best when he said, study hard what interests you the most in the most undisciplined, irreverent, and original manner possible. I've learned more from the internet than I ever did as a college student. And throughout the past few years, I've developed a set of 10 daily techniques that help me learn really fast while sustaining my motivation to continually learn. I'd like to share them with you to help you out on your learning journey. Yes, you specifically. All I ask is that you click the bell icon to be notified when I release these videos. Sound good? Let's start learning to learn. I was reading a Harvard study on the relationship between sleep and learning and discovered that learning and memory are often described in terms of three functions, acquisition, consolidation, and recall. That means the ability to acquire knowledge, store it, and access it later. While acquisition and recall occur only during wakefulness, research suggests that consolidation takes place when you sleep through the strengthening of neural connections that form our memories. Thus, sleep is an incredibly important part, yet often unacknowledged part, of the learning process. So I bought this sleep tracking ring called the Aura that packs in lots of sensors to measure metrics like my pulse, body temperature, and body movements. The idea is that quantifying my nights of sleep allows me to build a baseline of data of my sleep patterns so that I can then begin to address how to improve them. There are five stages of sleep. The first is when you transition into sleep and slowly you descend into deeper and deeper sleep until you reach REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movements and it's when our brain is active. It's when we dream, it's when I dream of cat girls. And most importantly, it's when we consolidate memory. The more REM sleep we can get, the better we'll learn. Thus the Aura uses various data points as features, building a labeled data set of how much REM sleep you got, what time you went to sleep, and when you woke up. It then uses a proprietary AI to start predicting what your optimal sleep and wake times should be in order to get the optimal amount of REM sleep. And this is different for everyone as all of our bodies follow a different circadian rhythm. I'm gonna guess that it's probably using a logistic regression model, and if you're curious how that works, I'll link to an explanation in the video description, as well as everything else I talk about here. Once I wake up, I make sure to exercise. The Athenian scholar Plato, author of my favorite work from ancient Greek literature, The Republic, once said that lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being while movement and methodical physical exercise save it and preserve it. Plato, the original trainer. I'll admit exercising does not come naturally to me. I've always been a bookworm and not really into playing sports, but through a lot of trial and error, I found a routine that works for me. I recently bought this device called the Peloton that allows me to cycle in my own home guided by a live instructor. It tracks my heart rate and calories burned, plotting these out over time, which gives me data that I can use to help me sustain motivation and achieve my ideal body fat ratio goals. And when I'm not cycling, I'm lifting weights to ensure I'm either maintaining or gaining muscle mass. A study done at the University of British Columbia found that regular aerobic exercise literally increases the size of your brain, specifically the hippocampus, the area involved with verbal memory and learning. Immediately after exercising, I make sure to take a shower, but not just any type of shower, a cold shower. Now, I have always been sensitive to cold water and I've been afraid to jump into pools that were too cold in the past, much to my friend's amusement. But now, after taking these cold showers for at least two months every day, they've become second nature to me. As I step in, I continually repeat to myself, pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. Pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. Pain is inevitable, suffering is a choice. And I'm able to control my sensual response to the temperature change using the power of my will. This practice eases stress, relieves depression, and most importantly, according to Healthline, when cold water hits your body, your blood circulation increases to maintain body temperature, and this effect lasts even after the shower is finished. 
You need to keep blood flowing to the learning organ, the brain, efficiently to learn most optimally. I have definitely found that I can think more clearly after doing this. It's like coffee, but without the caffeine. To quote the Bhagavad Gita, that which is bitter at first tastes like nectar in the end. And speaking of the Gita, this book has instilled the importance of meditation into me unlike any other self-help book I've ever read, including Sam Harris's Waking Up, which I loved. The Gita is unique in that it showed me how to practice yoga. Yoga isn't just stretching in a room with other people. It's a set of disciplines to attain a state of abiding joy and focus free from anxiety and depression. I've been meditating 30 minutes a day, every day for at least two months now. And I was recently on a trip to Tanzania to shoot the pilot for a docuseries. In the middle of the trip, I had something close to a panic attack. This intense anxiety gripped me and just wouldn't let go. Meditation has completely relieved me of that kind of anxiety. It's enabled me to focus better, be aware of my own emotions, control the negative ones, and allow myself to be peaceful at all times. Optimize for peacefulness, because a peaceful person can convert peace into happiness at any time. A peaceful person will be happy doing anything. Meditation has been so beneficial to me that I no longer feel the need to use drugs. Things like coffee to work faster, or weed, or alcohol to relax on the weekends. When I try any drug, I feel a buzz, but it's no longer a positive buzz. I'm in a less happy, less peaceful state than when I'm sober. This was not the case before meditation, so I am supremely grateful for this practice. It's also made me more productive in terms of learning. Researchers at Erasmus University found that just 10 to 12 minutes of meditation a day enhances creativity, the ability to focus attention, reduces anxiety and depression. I sit in a clean spot and observe my own thoughts. Without judgment, I just observe. Eventually, with enough practice, I'm talking weeks of daily practice, I'm able to experience this state where I am no longer an I. I lose my sense of ego and experience a deep, fulfilling joy. It's better than any drug. It's a difficult practice, not necessarily fun, but the benefits from it are clearly worth it for me. After that, I immediately eat breakfast. I use a meal delivery service called Zen Foods because I really don't like to cook. I basically gave them my ideal body fat ratio and the amount of calories I'd want every day, as well as my dietary restrictions, which are basically no processed sugar, no soylent, and they take care of the rest. Data-driven food. Now, I realize that not everyone can afford daily meal delivery or that people like to cook. Another great option here is to use an app called Fit Genie to track your calories and your macronutrient ratios, meaning carbs, fats, and protein. It uses AI to compute precise meal plans suited towards your goals and suggests them to you, probably using a form of supervised learning where the label is healthy or not healthy given your dietary restrictions. There are Android apps out there as well. Just search AI diet planning. Once I've eaten breakfast, I make sure to open up an incognito window and start working. Notice how I haven't mentioned looking at my phone or glancing at social media. This is yet another technique I've learned. Our brains have multiple states, beta, alpha, gamma, delta, and theta. When you wake up in the morning, your mind is in the theta state, the gateway to learning, memory, and intuition. But when we check our phones, we hinder this state and reduce our mind's ability to learn. Our phones are a window into other people's lives. We become reactive instead of being in a state of learning. Studies show that 80% of us look at our phone first thing in the morning and last thing before we sleep. We are literally training ourselves to be more distracted. So I time box when I check social media to engage with people, post content, and learn things. This way I can maintain my flow state for a long time to help me learn. Now another technique I practice that I've learned from former monk Jay Shetty is the practice of planting seeds and removing weeds. The idea is that I have a bunch of learning goals, whether it's making a documentary or completing a world tour. There are a lot of things I have to learn to get there, and this helps drive my learning process. A lot of times the motivations behind those goals could be vanity, 
ego, pride, but they could also be love, compassion, and service. Every day I perform the practice of removing the ones that are negative, the weeds, and adding or keeping the ones that are positive, the seeds. In this way, I am slowly refining my learning goals to help keep me motivated. In the journal Educational Leadership, a study found that clear learning goals help students learn better by motivating them to monitor and adjust their strategies as well as connect new concepts to previous concepts. Knowledge and action are inextricably connected, and my goal is to use knowledge as a tool to serve other people. Once I have these learning goals, I define curriculums for each of them. These are ordered sequential learning paths that I compile using a wide variety of resources from the internet. And I have a more detailed video on how to make those I'll link you to. Now, let me clarify how to use social media. I use it in time boxed intervals to learn. I don't just mindlessly check it like the algorithms train us to do. Don't let these algorithms control your mind. Algorithms on social platforms are not designed to benefit you in any way. They are designed for one thing only, to keep your eyes on their page as long as possible, so they make ad money. Tristan Harris, former Googler and founder of the Time Well Spent movement, states that by shaping the menus we pick from, technology hijacks the way we perceive our choices and replaces them with new ones. But the closer we pay attention to the options we're given, the more we'll notice when they don't actually align with our true needs. We want the algorithms to work for us. Thus, it's important to create a curated list of people that you'd like to follow, who offer you something valuable to learn and grow from. I've learned so much from top researchers on Twitter like Francois Chalet, Hard Maru, and more. The same goes for educators on YouTube and certain subreddits. I'll link you to some good ones in the description. Curate your learning content as you see fit. Don't let the algorithms distract you. This is a constant battle for attention. The enemy is the algorithm and the battlefield is your mind. So as Krishna said on the battlefield to Arjuna in the Gita, fight in this battle, controlling your senses, conquer your enemy, the destroyer of knowledge and realization. After I've completed a learning session, I have to make sure to constantly teach what I've learned. Usually it's just me around, so I teach myself. Either I'm visualizing some mathematical concept on my whiteboard, I'm coding some quick prototype out to see what it looks like, I'm writing about it in a Google Doc for a new video, or I might just call up a friend and discuss what I've learned with them. This act of explaining things to a five-year-old helps create an extremely robust representation of a concept in your brain. And a new study out of Applied Cognitive Psychology found that this is because teaching brings to our conscious minds that which we've previously studied and this creates stronger and more lasting neural connections. And once I'm done learning, something I make sure to do when I'm done is to try something else. Sometimes I'll go for a walk. Sometimes I'll just sit on the beach. Sometimes I'll just contemplate life or be listening to an audiobook I really like. Sometimes I'll play the piano or the flute or the guitar. It always changes. Anything to take my mind off of what I was just doing. Studies show that our ability to concentrate and learn decreases over a period of time, so we need to take breaks to renew it. I make sure to do this often. So those are my techniques. I hope they inspired you to develop your own daily rituals to make sure your body and mind are optimally healthy, that you have a purpose that you are working towards, and that you are happy in your day-to-day -day life. AI, basically data and algorithms, are tools to help us do this, and I can't wait to continually refine the tools I use to achieve more personal growth so that I can ultimately serve you better.